of uh, higher education leadership. I mean, if you look at, uh, I mean, appointment of uh, vice chancellor or appointment of a registrar or uh, appointment of uh, key officials in uh, higher education sector, if you look at the numbers which are available, I and mean, you find that very, very few people are available. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm part of uh, all the executive councils to, to appoint a registrar. There hardly one or two choices. Same as the case uh, uh, when search committees look around uh, for appointing uh, top officials in higher education. And, and I'm just giving an example that even at the very top, if you see, the, the, the uh, choices are very, very kind of uh, limited. That's why there's a very, very strong need for uh, developing uh, higher education leadership. Uh, yeah. And if, we, if I can expand the word leadership, I mean, it's a bad leadership, not just in terms of people who are uh, managing uh, the universities or managing the colleges or managing the institutions, but leadership in terms of uh, uh, teaching itself, because uh, uh, a leader is not just a leader who is at the top, but everybody is uh, a leader in their own right. I mean, a, a person who is uh, uh, doing a very, very kind of routine job, I would say, you know, that person is also a leader in a sense that uh, only when he understands what uh, imbibes what he's supposed to do, then only there's a perfection in the job. So there's also uh, this need for expanding this leadership in, in each and every area of uh, higher education. So I'm sure that this workshop will uh, throw a lot of uh, light uh, on this issue as to how do you really develop uh, and uh, expand higher education uh, leadership. The second uh, part of the workshop is strategic approaches to transforming uh, education as well as learning. And as Professor Nipadri very, very, I would say, uh, brilliantly brought out uh, the issues on the table, uh, there's a great, great need for it. And I think we all understand that, uh, especially in our country and uh, as well as in our state, there is a need to transform uh, higher education and uh, learning. Uh, there are certain things we are doing right, but there are a lot of things which we need to do right uh, in terms of uh, uh, the aspirations which our country has. Today, uh, uh, this year, we have overtaken uh, uh, UK to become the uh, uh, sixth largest economy of the world. And this year, we are likely to overtake France also to become the fifth largest economy. In, in, in about four years' time, we'll be overtaking Germany in terms of economic size. So we'll become uh, the fourth largest and keep growing at this rate, something like 7, 7.5% seven seven in real terms and about 11, 11.5% 11 uh, percent in uh, nominal terms. In about a decade, we are going to overtake uh, Japan and become the third largest economy. So what, what I'm trying to say is that when we are, our aspirations are uh, in terms of global leadership, Higher education sector cannot be left behind. Uh, because Lipadri talked about the IITs. I mean, I've, I've personally studied in one of the IITs uh, way back, almost two decades back. And I can tell you that at that time, uh, for example, the, the department in which I was in, we were a class of 40. 36 students uh, out of 40 went to US. So, so IITs were more of a passport to uh, uh, go to US. Of course, things have dramatically transformed. I was talking to somebody who passed out uh, very recently, 2015 pass out, and then they told me. Then they told me that today, not many, not many people want to go to US because they find that India provides huge opportunities. Right? In IIT Mumbai, uh, most of the students, especially in branches like computer science, they would have already incorporated their startups before they pass out from the college. So there's this huge uh, culture which is uh, becoming, coming to our uh, country. But that's only in, in, in the uh, topmost or top few institutes of the country. But there are large number. In, for example, Telangana itself has something like 212 engineering colleges producing roughly 70 to 75,000 engineers every year. And uh, in our degree systems, if we, if we calculate BA, BCOM, BSE. Every year we are admitting uh, more than uh, 2 lakh students 
200,000 students uh, plus are getting admitted every year. Now, when these students are passing out and coming into the market, into the job market, are they ready or are they equipped to do uh, what they aspire to do? I mean, things like are they job ready? Uh, are they uh, uh, ready as an entrepreneur? Or are they ready to move into, uh, let's say, a teaching profession or higher education or uh, even a government job? And these are the four five things which uh, most students uh, want to get into, either into a private sector job or a government job or becoming an entrepreneur or maybe a higher education, uh, mostly leading to teaching or popped out of, uh, come out of it and then do, maybe do a beard and then get into school uh, teaching. So are these students uh, really equipped when they come out? I'm not saying that our curriculum can completely serve the needs of the students. I mean, obviously, no curriculum anywhere in the world uh, serves this need. Because the technology uh, is changing so fast that curriculum will find it always difficult to keep pace with it. And uh, this whole concept of that uh, engineer when he is uh, passing out of uh, uh, B-Tech or uh, B, I mean, he's directly, uh, he can, he can uh, do a particular job is also a myth, I would say, because no engineering education can, can make a person 100% job ready on day one. But there are a lot of other things. For example, basic skills in terms of handling computers, in handling in communication, in terms of basic uh, uh, leadership or basic management of uh, what to do on a job. Even those things uh, students are lacking. In fact, we are uh, having a, a program which is run by UNDP uh, support for uh, training the, the students in uh, becoming job ready. And uh, we had a, a, a session with them a few months back and they were telling that students who are in the final year of graduation, they do not have an email address. Even an email address is not there for a final year student. So I mean, I'm saying with curriculum is totally one thing, but these are the these are the kind of things a student when he comes out is he able to communicate what he wants to say. Those are the things which are completely, completely uh, absent, I mean, almost negligible. It's very interesting thing I tell you, I mean, Council of Higher Education with the help of universities and with the help of commissioner, we were redesigning the curriculum for the for the for this year. Of course, we postponed it because UGC is also coming out with a with a uh, outcome, learning outcome uh, based uh, curriculum. So we thought that instead of doing it twice, let's do it once, uh, so that we combine what UGC comes out with and then what idea we have uh, to bring it out and we wanted to transform our English language program into a communication program. So the whole program of English language learning wherein even a BSc student is forced to study English literature into a communication program and one of the university uh, department of languages came out and said that oh we were transforming a language into communication and both myself and I think VC Venk Kamna uh, 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 Vice Chairman of Council, we were sitting in his uh, room and then uh, we got this person who came in and he said, oh, you are transforming language into communication. And he said, this is what it should have been. This is precisely what it should have been. It is that you have got away doing this for so many years, wasting students' time in terms of uh, teaching them something which which activity is not leading to anything. And they should have been basically made good in communication rather than English literature. And that's what a BCom graduate or a BSc graduate needs. So I'm just telling you as an example that we need to think through what is our ultimate objective. What a student when he comes out of after uh, uh, three years of a graduate program and a two years of postgraduate uh, or even a PhD or uh, engineering what, the, what do we want, what skills, what capabilities, what knowledge, what aptitude we want this student to have when he or she comes out of an institute of higher education learning. Only when we have clarity on that, we can have our 
clear strategic approaches to kind of address that and build that. And I'm sure that uh, uh, today's workshop will provide a uh, uh, good level of uh, thinking as well as international experience in uh, what is being done uh, in other parts of the world to do that. And it will be a great learning experience for all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much. He has drawn a lot of from the insight, such as the higher education, how and what the direction should be higher education. Thank you for your argument. Uh, suggestions to our teachers. Now I request uh, Ms. Mandela Rao, Director of Higher Education, please come to please. This is the first time that we are doing this, but I hope there will be many more um, such uh, workshops that we will be organizing. Uh, I must say I have been interacting with the state uh, officials, right from the minister to the secretary and now uh, the council. And uh, believe me, they are all extremely supportive of uh, uh, strengthening higher education and working with international uh, organizations to uh, leapfrog and support in whatever they are doing. I think, uh, and this is true of all higher education systems across the world which have expanded fast. And um, so how are we going to address uh, some of these? I mean, if you remember, if, if you go five years ago, uh, the government of India said there are three priorities for them. One of them is uh, equity, access, and excellence. And then a fourth one got added, which is employability. And I think today everybody believes that employability is really something that we should be focusing on. Uh, speakers before me have said that uh, employability is critical, and therefore we are changing the curriculum uh, to address some of this, make uh, have some more job-oriented courses, introduce them into all the courses. But I think what's important is not just uh, what we teach, but how we teach. Uh, and to achieve these four objectives, ambitions of government of India, of equity, excellence, access, and employability, I think leadership is really critical. Um, and leadership at all levels. It's not just people in positions of uh, power and authority, but I think across the board. Um, so I I'm really pleased that we are organizing this workshop and on this important subject, and we have uh, our two facilitators, Becky Smith and Joe Chapa from Advanced Edgy. Uh, they'll talk more about what Advanced Edgy does and their own background, so I won't go into that. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about British Council and what we do. Uh, British Council is UK's international cultural org uh, organization, uh, providing opportunity, educational opportunities and cultural relations between UK and India. So we work in three areas, education, English language, and arts, uh, in addition to running a network of nine libraries, which you may be familiar with, because we have one here in Hyderabad, and have had one for many, many years. Uh, our work in higher education um, contributes to improving opportunities for young people, giving them access to English language, creativity, UK ideas, and education. And what we do is really facilitate partnerships between UK and Indian institutions, higher education institutions, both in for research collaborations as well as transnational partnerships. We support faculty mobility of faculty as well as students, build capacity and uh, capability through continuing professional uh, development uh, programs. And we, we emphasize on including uh, and providing access to women and girls uh, in education. More specifically, we create, as I said, we create opportunities for young people to succeed um, and improve their employability chances. Support international research collaborations, enable student and academic partnerships and mobility between universities, governments, and industry. Uh, give young people the tools and skills to transform themselves and their communities. I think there was talk about employability. So there are, apart from the discipline areas that you all teach your students in, I think there are four C's that uh, we need to emphasize on. One of them has already been talked about, which is communication. Uh, there's also creativity, 
um, collaboration as well as critical thinking. So these four C or the graduate attributes are really important. How you integrate that with your teaching is something that you need to think about. Um, the British Council also manages uh, programs, bilateral programs, on behalf of the UK government. We have two flagship programs. One of them is the UK India Education and Research Initiative. I hope some of you have benefited from that, whether you have uh, research collaboration or whether you had uh, uh, sent your students uh, for studying in the UK. Uh, UK has is, uh, this is the 12th year of UK and uh, we have two specific um, areas that UK focuses on. One of them is partnerships and the other is education and training. Uh, and under education and training, we, we offer faculty development programs and uh, such as this one, the leadership workshop. And there is also a skills component for which we work with the Ministry of uh, Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. The other program, Newton Baba, which is a large bilateral program, again, um, supports research collaborations, building an ecosystem and strengthening uh, India's high, uh, research ecosystem. We offer placements for PhD students to go and spend uh, some time in the UK and vice versa. So UK students also come and spend time in our labs. There are 60 of these PhD placements offered every year. We encourage women who are, we find that many of the women drop out of the STEM subjects, the science, engineering, mathematics subjects um, at different stages in their life. So we are offering uh, alternative career development programs for them uh, to look at careers within the science so that they at least remain in the sector. Uh, we have so far trained 1,300 uh, college faculty in STEM education. This is a five-day program that we organize every year for the last three years. And each batch has a uh, uh, batch length is about 150. So uh, each year we train the close to 500 of these faculty in how to teach. Um, we also offer a very large uh, scholarship program. UK invests uh, considerable funding, so there's almost uh, five million uh, pounds, five million uh, pounds available for about 500 uh, scholarships each year. So, and this is not counting the scholarships that are offered by UK University. So, uh, with those few words, I'd just like to end there and uh, thank our partners for today. Um, and thank you all for coming. Good morning to all of you. Uh, Delhi Sanadayas, Navid Mithal Commissioner of College Education, Telangana State. Mr. Nibar Gagaru, the Vice President of Telangana State Commissioner of College Education. Professor Mehta Kamanagaru, Head Chairman, Head Professor of Higher Education, and three more institutes from the British High Commission, Ms. Mandra Rao, Director of Education, British Council, Joe Chopper, Associated, Associate of Non Higher Education, and Global Consultant.
their their own policies. Not only that, the education is another factor. Neither the centers nor the states have taken up mental responsibility. There is always there is a tussle between the center and the states whenever the responsibility comes in the question of education. This is also one challenge in education in India. We have been seeing last 30, 40 years. No. A satisfactory solution from the central or state governments regarding the further education and translation. So, this one issue. The second one is now there are two issues. Always to be increase the cross and government ratio in higher education. That is the best. The cost. When we compare it to the other countries, not to speak about the Europe. Only. The states, even to speak about our East Asian countries or our Nagari countries, they are far ahead of our GRI ratio. We want to increase the GRI ratio, now we are having the 24 25 percent in our event. So, we are not going to be able to Why do you want to increase the GRI ratio? That is an indicator for economic development of the society. We want a real Transformation of our economy and society. We have to provide more and more access to higher education to the larger population. This is one important challenge or task for higher education. But unfortunately, whatever the GRE ratio we are having, 24 or 25 percent, the students are not in position to get it employed. That is one more challenge. The cost of the problem. This, one. this is also one of the serious challenge we have to address the challenge. How to increase the GRE ratio on one side to one side? How to create employment on one side? Third challenge is the leadership. This is the most, my opinion, this is the most important uh, aspect in the higher education. We have been number of instances. Suppose a person is in charge for a college for some time. The college runs on sound lines. Suppose that principal should transfer to somewhere. Suddenly the college collapses. That shows that a strong correlation or relationship between the a leader or leadership of the institution. Maybe the college or maybe the university or maybe the entire office. A strong nexus between the leadership as well as the running of institution successfully. That is why whoever may be the aim of success in the institution or the university, he has to take the whether the credit or the If he runs on sound lines or correct lines, he should take the credit. Should not, he has to take the credit. Why? Because the leader has to provide a leadership. He should inspire the, the institution of university. Even the case of the university states, we have remembered a very few items, not all. Why? We have to grow the workshops. Because they provided a strong leadership to the university. The leadership for so many things, leadership to good governance, leadership to develop the curriculum, develop the academic standards, give quality education, give all the development of a institution. That is why we, the high commission of leadership, as opposed to the state council, we have really agreed to have a workshop on this issue because the leadership is a very important issue and governance is also an important issue. And our the institutions and universities have been struggling with this issue. Therefore, we should have some kind of a workshop to 
discuss about the issues and I request all the participants. You have to give the inputs. How to improve the colleges, universities in Telegram State? What are the options we are having? What are the mechanisms of instruments we are having? And what are the challenges of the I was the chief website counselor for our private research chairman. There are a lot of problems for the universities and countries. Universities are suffering with the lack of funds, lack of regular staff, lack of support to staff in the universities. And the university vitals have been facing day to day problems to tackle all these problems. Day to day, not a major issue to they have, uh, by and large, tied out to the daily petty issues. And they are unable to concentrate a, a much higher or much bigger issues like the transforming academic atmosphere, the syllabuses, or how to create a, a good environment in the campus. Therefore, my I appeal to all of you, please give some inputs to the state council, universities and government. Definitely we will take your uh, the advices and your the inputs to restructure the higher education system in coming years. With you two words, I thank the audience for giving me thanks. Thank you. On behalf of the State Council of Higher Education, I think we have been privileged to be part of this program. program. And I would like to thank uh, two speakers who have come all the way. Ms. Joe Schaffer, Associate Director, Higher Education, and Robert Kassandra. Ms. Becky Smith, who is the Assistant Director, International Business Development and Delivery. Of course, our thanks are due to Ms. Manjula Rao, who has taken the initiative and partnered with us, <coughs> and I'm sure we will be able to do many more events. Ms. Manjula Rao spoke about the four C's, critical thinking, communication, and other ones. She also spoke about STEM, which is emerging as a very major area. In fact, uh, India as such doesn't have a STEM policy in higher education, but increasingly there's a demand for having uh, approaches towards STEM to be taken up. Well, thanks are due to, uh, to Mr. Navin Mitter, who has always been a uh, disruptor in the field of higher education. I'm saying with a lot of confidence, because over the last one year, we have been working with Mr. Mitter, who is a very good initiator, disruptor, and thinker, and innovator. And I think many more I can add because of our association, and we have been trying to do things. Our chairman, Professor Patanidhi, has always been supportive. In fact, uh, the State Council today, as it is, has taken up so many activities because of his ideas, and he has always been encouraging. As I'm speaking, I'm also planning for a very big event tomorrow for the Startup Center, which is going to the grand final, where we are going to uh, really attract some innovators. Our thanks are also, uh, are also due to all the vice chancellors, the discharge, decision makers, policy makers, common degree college principals members of the council who have always been supportive for activities, a uh, lot of uh, senior academic leaders, and of course, <coughs> members of the media, and our own staff from the State Council of Higher Education. I would now request all of you to kindly uh, break for a cup of tea. But before that, as a token of our appreciation, we would like to felicitate our distinguished guests. May I have uh, uh, our chairman would uh, state Ms. Manjula Rawal and uh, for our two international speakers, this is a token of our appreciation. The shawl and memento. Uh, Can we put our hands together? <laughs> Professor Nimbati would felicitate uh, <coughs> Joe Chakra. Would she be right? Yeah, <laughs> 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 Okay. 
ఇయర్ పాస్ అవ్వాలి ఈ వర్క్షాప్ లోనేమో వైస్ బ్రిటిష్ కౌన్సిల్ చాలా ఇట్లాంటి ప్రోగ్రామ్స్ చాలా చేస్తున్నారు చేస్తున్నారండి లైట్ బంద్ లేదా మొత్తం లూజ్ వస్తుంది లైట్ అందుకే బంద్ చేసిన అన్ని లెవెల్స్లోనూ లీడర్షిప్ ఉండాలి లైట్ ఏమన్నారు అది దాని మీద ఫోకస్ టీచింగ్ ఒకటి లర్నింగ్ అనేది ఒకటి ఎలా స్టూడెంట్స్ నేర్చుకుంటున్నారు వాళ్ళ అటెన్షన్ స్పామ్ తగ్గిపోతూ ఉంటే మనం టీచింగ్ కూడా ఎలా మార్చాలి అది దాని గురించి స్టాండర్డ్ ఫ్రేమ్ వర్క్స్ అవి కూడా ఉంటాయి ఆ క్వాలిటీ ఫ్రేమ్ వర్క్స్ యూకే నుంచి వచ్చిన వాళ్ళు అడ్వాన్స్ ఇచ్చి wonderful to see you all here today and um, I thank you all very much for coming and thank you uh, to the Telangana State Council for Higher Education for such a very warm welcome. I know Joe and myself are very appreciative of all the effort um, that has gone into the organization for today. Um, and we also want to thank our partner, the British Council, for the work that they have done to support us coming to be with you today. Um, today, Joe and I are hoping you will find it a very productive day. It is just a taster um, of what we hope uh, we can grow and that might stimulate some ideas for you. Um, we're looking to focus today, as has been mentioned, on growing leadership in higher education and looking at strategic approaches to transform teaching and learning. And we noted a lot of the comments 
uh, made by the Honourable Speakers earlier, and we hope that we will actually touch on a lot of those areas throughout today's session as well. So I wanted to start um, by introducing um, our organisation, and um, before I do that, I want to also just um, introduce my colleague and associate, Joe Chaffer. Uh, Joe works uh, with our organisation, and um, we are very lucky to have her, and uh, she provides a lot of very valuable input to what we do. Uh, and Joe is going to lead your session uh, today. Are you going to just say a few words? Yes, um, thank you uh, for the wonderful welcome so far. And I hope it's going to be a useful and interesting session. Because those two words are featured prominently in my vocabulary. Both have to be there. Uh, I'll be leading uh, I'll be on leadership. Um, and be before that, I'll tell you more about me when we go into my session. Okay, and uh, as I, I have been kindly introduced, uh, my name is Becky Smith and I am the Assistant Director for International for Advanced HE. And a few of you have been asking me, what is Advanced HE? So I'm going to share that with you now, just to give you a brief overview. So Advanced HE is an organisation that has really been set up as a result of a merger. And the merger has come about for three different organisations that operated only in the higher education sector. And these three organisations have been working for many years to support universities and higher education institutes to get better at what they do. Originally, we were all funded by the UK government. Then the funding was cut and we became independent, non-profit, charitable organisations. And that has two other benefits. One is that we don't have to answer to a higher authority. And two, we can work globally. So we are not tied to working in the UK. And in fact now, we work with over 350 universities globally. We work with governments and we work with individuals. Um, so we, together, our purpose is to advance the professional practice of higher education to improve the outcomes for the benefits of students, staff and society. That's what we're trying to do. We do that in four different areas. We work in leadership management and we work in governance and we work in teaching and learning professionalisation and we work in equality, diversity and inclusion. As I mentioned, we are a charity and we are non-profit. And together, we also work around the world in over 50 different countries. So we're very extensive in what we do and we're here to support you. I mentioned some of the organisations that we work with and I'm just going to pick on a couple of things there. So at the government level, we have worked uh, internationally uh, with governments such as the Ukraine, with governments such as Bahrain, and we've been looking at transformation projects there. So for example, in the Ukraine, you will know that they worked in, under a Soviet system, very centralized. Now they are moving to uh, a much freer system with autonomy for institutions. So under a program over three years, working in collaboration with the British Council again, we have been leading that transformation uh, and assisting them with their leadership development there. At university level, uh, we run training programs. We um, also uh, provide accreditation for staff professional development programs. Um, and we also run um, what we call our charters and awards. So this is recognizing when institutions and departments within institutions have reached certain benchmarks, uh, globally recognized or nationally recognized benchmarks, particularly in the area of equality, uh, gender equality, and race equality. At the individual level, we also work to develop um, staff within universities. Maybe that is through attending a training program or coming to a conference or a workshop event. But it can also be through executive coaching, and Joe uh, also does some executive coaching uh, for us. 
And we then have a very, very extensive fellowship program for um, academic faculty. And I'm going to talk to you this afternoon in more detail about that program. So we have a number of key partners, as you know from today. We work with the British Council. We also work uh, collaboratively with Times Higher, um, which some of you may know from the rankings. I know um, the State Council uh, members here were in Singapore last week at the World Academic Summit uh, run by the Times Higher. Um, so we do have a close relationship with them. But we also work with a number of collaborative um, partners, uh, not official partners, but for example with the Quality Assurance Agency in the UK. Uh, so we have very close working relationships and we draw on expertise as we need to. Uh, this song here, this is just a sample of some of the uh, countries that we work with and some of the types of work that we have done. Um, perhaps just to pick out uh, a couple on there, uh, so for example, um, I, I know that you talked earlier about um, curriculum development and learning based outcomes. So in Saudi Arabia we have worked with um, Tate University uh, to do just that uh, and looking at trying to have constructive alignment in terms of the learners' uh, outcomes that are embedded in the curriculum. We've also been looking at embedding employability. So for example, in South Africa, we again worked with the British Council um, to really work with their careers uh, departments within their university sector to look at how they could better enhance employability skills there. Um, so I think at that point, I'm going to hand back over to Jo. Yeah, you've heard from us and you've heard from uh, the State Council and from Mandela. I'm really curious now to find out who we've got here in the room. Um, I, I see from the chatter, or I hear from the chatter at tea break. Uh, do you know everybody else in the room? No? Yes? Maybe? Okay. That's all then. Um, what institutes have we got here? Could you tell me what, uh, what the... What universities or higher education institutes? Could you be a call out? Who is here? The hall is too bright to see those lights. Okay, yeah. Nice. Can, we, can we turn the TV on? Yeah. Yeah. Get these lights out. Is that possible? Uh, who, who is here? What universities have you Hello, yes. Where else? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? So, um, today's session this morning will be a growing leadership in higher education. A lunch break about 1.30, 1.45. If you're okay, then we will have some uh, flexibility on that timing. Yep. Um, the sessions that we're both on uh, will be a little bit of input from us to share some of the learning mostly actually, and uh, to get, ask you guys to do some of the work as well. There's some interaction, some activities, and discussion. Today, um, there we go. Fantastic. Can we agree on some of the following things? Uh, mobile phones. Who's got mobile phones with them? I think everybody. Would it be okay to ask you to have those on silent or off? Is that okay? And we'd like you to have a full and honest discussion. Can we also ask for chat and house rules? This means can we speak in confidence? Um, everyone agrees? Great. Um, some of the ways in which we operate. Um, throughout my work, I've found that assumptions make assumptions. I don't make them of you. Please ask. If you're not sure, please ask questions. 
I would say one of the fundamentals of good leadership is the ability to ask text. I run my practice slides, respect all, fear none. So that means we, uh, we take time to listen carefully to others and also we respect them. But also we are not afraid to say what we think. So we can ask for your, your honest and full very important questions. And on that note, um, again, I work for an equality basis, which is that we're all differently brilliant and brilliantly different. So there's a richness in our diversity, and again, this is what makes for a good, informed, and um, progressive development of practice. One of the things that we'll take away from today, hopefully, is more of a sense of, um, but to have your peers with you, also leaders in this together, which um, is there anything else that we should agree before we start? We're going to finish at five, um, as planned. Um, and... oh, is there something? Are you feeling full of energy? No. I'm going to ask you in a moment to get up. Would, would you first of all... Um, fi so, you'll need to... You don't need anything with you, it's just your wonderful minds and your convenience.
champion for a university in the UK, so working in a senior position um, to build up the entrepreneurial capacity of academics and students in curricula and out of curricula. So hopefully I can help add to some of the discussion here today around that area. Um, as, a, as a professional, I'm also a leadership development practitioner and I work around the world uh, with different institutes. Um, in India, I work with some of the large fintech companies and, and multinationals, um, and I also work with startups um, and incubator cells as well. So that's me. Um, hopefully, I can bring you some useful insights um, harvested from the different companies and organisations that I've been working with on leadership and some of my research as well. So, leadership. We face these complex challenges in the world. We have, we've had already from our esteemed speakers. Today, several cries, what we need is leadership. We have a higher education system that's being had some of the funding reduced, that is being where demands are being made honours by industry, by government, by parents, by students. They're pushed and pulled in all directions. And the cry goes up, what we need is leadership. But what does that mean? What is leadership? And what does it look like? How should we practice it? How should we be in terms of leadership? This session is about exploring some of this. And when we say what we need in leadership, what we find is that there are, there are so many words. There must be, well, there's more than 50 shades here of grey. And there's probably, at, at the last count, there's 350 to 400 just common collocations. Leadership as a word rarely, in fact never I would say, stands on its own. It has always an adjective in front of it. And those adjectives change through time, through history, through cultures, and they all mean different things to different people. So we started off in the West with Lewin's work around um, some of the transformational leadership, democratic leadership, moving through the ages. 
There's now spiritual leadership, authentic leadership, green leadership, strong leadership. I don't know what you would call Mr. Trump, but there's another type of leadership there. There is then the post-heroic movement, when we moved away from the leadership and leader being conflated into one person, into a more distributed and collective time. That happened in the West, pre to the, prior to the Second World War, after Taylorism, after scientific managerialism, um, and then came back again uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Distributed collective leadership, where leadership as a practice flows out amongst many people. We seem to uh, wobble between the two. We have, at, at, at the one hand, we have these, these leaders on pedestals um, who we treat almost as demigods, and we expect them to be all things to all people, to be expert in everything, and to fix everything. And also, we want leadership amongst ourselves. The trend at the moment, I would say, is, for, is, to, is a confused trend between both. We have these, these, these huge political figures coming out and holding the, the voice of the nation. On the other hand, we have movements working against and with those political leaders in industry and in higher education as well. So what should leadership be? What does leadership mean? And how do we uh, work with it? What does leadership mean for you in your position? So a question for you now um, to engage with on your table, and I'm going to ask this is just three minutes. Leadership as a word exists in most languages around the world, but not all. But let's imagine a time now where we've taken a huge eraser and we have deleted the word leadership from all of our vocabularies. As, and the problems exist in the world that we face today and the opportunities as well. So in general, on your table, could you have a quick chat and tell me what word or words would you replace leadership with? Leadership is gone. But we, what we need is... What's the new word? What are the new words? Okay, three minutes and it's a discussion. You don't need to write... Um, Three minutes to think about that. But this is the problem, isn't it? Leadership is a broad word. So, um, team leaders. <laughs> Uh, well, kind of a team builder. Okay, great. A guide, yeah. Motivator. Motivator. Visionary. Captain, okay. The boss. The boss, okay. Director. Supreme. Capacitator, that's a good word. No word. Okay. Management. Management. Facilitator, yeah, okay. All these little roles. Influencer change. Influencer change. Captain. Captain. Transformer. Transformer, okay. So statesmanship. 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 Yeah, statesmanship. Often a word that's perhaps missing in some of some of the leaders at the moment. Mentor. Motivator to guide. Um, so, and visionary. Somehow someone who can see the future and t tell us what's going to happen. We've just talked up. Mentor. Mentor. So someone should be like a head of the family. He should be. Okay. There's an there's an assumption. Okay. <laughs> should be a guide and driving force. A guide and a driving force. A facilitator to make easy. The change may be driven by others. Organizer. An organizer, okay. There should be a visionary. Visionary? New year. A doer. What is expected, what do you believe your word is that leadership doesn't exist? Is it something different or is it a, a word that you've used already? Okay. Would you take two minutes and just think, what word would I describe myself with if I remove leadership? What would replace it? in me, in my role at this time right now. Okay?
So lots of things held in that word, the motivator for others to work and the structures uh, within which to do that and the systems. My work at that time came into leadership as agency, the ability to act with the recognition by self. Okay. In your role at this time, at this moment, you would be, you would be a master. Yeah? Same thing. I keep my entire college as my family and I keep myself as the head of the family, looking at the needs of everybody. So head of the family. Yeah? Brilliant. Okay? Participants and management. Okay, great. Okay. Madam, uh, you have attributed, four, if I counted it properly, you have attributed 14 traits to the leadership in your earlier slide. So it is, it, it is, it is very difficult to substitute the word leadership with another word because leadership is collective. Collective, the kind of role that you are talking of, the context of your role. Our role of leadership is transitionary, so it is multiple. Brilliant. That's exactly the, the conclusion we're coming to here. Leadership is a B. So, what is the student's perspective of you and your role? What are the messages going on? No elephants in the room. But actually, we can be specific and clear. And once we have a common understanding, then we have a much stronger expectation and possibility of going forward together and bringing our people with us. So the question of what is leadership, when we say we need leadership, it's up to you. You fill that word up. Ideally, you co-define it with your people in your place. And you'll be much more effective just by that simple change. So through um, quite a lot of academic research and through a lot of practice working in leadership development across the years, sorry, I'm in the way, um, we've come up with um, a series of, um, a, a small framework here by which we can interrogate leadership um, in, in any position, pretty much. And this is leadership in all forms, not leadership and leader. I know those two are often conflated. So these P's, and I'll, I'll, I will give you all the slides for these afterwards if you, if you need them. Uh, these uh, P's represent some of perhaps the questions that we can use to interrogate what's happening in leadership, particularly when we're stuck. So the first P is the biggest one. Um, leadership is about power. Um, it's about power and influence. Um, and so to be mindful of power, to hold question around what's happening with power flows here? What are the power dynamics? If you need to influence people outside of your authoritative position, what power flows have you got that you can engage to help influence them? It's very, very likely that that will be the glue that holds you all together in tough times. It's, it's an amazing motivator when it's clearly articulated and understood and lived by all to get everyone going all together in the same direction. And the place, by yeah, the P of place here is not just the physical place, it's not just Hyderabad, it's not India. It is also that. It's, it's also the historical stuff, everything that's come before, right up until this point in time. Where do we sit in that evolutionary line within our organisation, within my role? Those echoes, those memories um, are part of what we do now in the present. There's also the more um, tangible aspects. Where are we culturally? What is the culture of this organization? What's the culture of the state in which we sit? And how does that affect and influence change? This is one of your um, strings that you will be pulling and pushing in leadership um, to start to make change happen, those of you who are in a transformative role or a facilitative role. Increasingly importantly for universities in this very cluttered and internationalised market, for student choice and for getting the best faculty, what makes this place special? Why is our university important? And what makes it unique and different in a good way that others will want to come to? That's students, that's business, uh, that's funders, uh, that's grant makers, and most critically it's faculty and professional staff. 
the processes of leadership. What, what things are we in, enacting on a daily basis? What behaviours do we show? How do we enforce those across our people? How do we influence with those? And what's the balance between them? Are we very process-driven, or are we much more free radicals? The practices and the arts of leadership, again, speaking about behaviours. How, what are the skills that we have? What are the skills that we don't have? How are we leveraging those? You'll find most leadership development programmes focus on practices and process, and another of the P's further down. The position, be mindful. This is a critical question. Um, there are many people with the role of leader who don't have leadership. There are equally many people without the role of leader that do have leadership. So leadership and leader are not two of the same things. Um, but where does your authority, where does your power come, which is just from your position, and where is it from your, who you are and your influence? The, third, the last P here of person, your, who are you? What's your character? What's your personality that you bring into the role? And what do you, how does this exert influence on others? The majority of leadership development uh, programs around the world, and there are many, there's about $57 billion worth of leadership development happened last year, according to the latest McKinsey report. Most of it is failed, most of it is money poorly spent, because it tries to work on person and practice and process. They're competency-based programs. They're trait-based programs. And if you think about it, you've been becoming who you are for all of your life. I know that's only 21, 25 years old for most of you here. And for me, it's 49. I've spent 49 years becoming who I am. A half day or even a week program on leadership development, working on traits, is not going to change me. So the, the things that we can change, though, are a critical assessment of where they are and our practices and our processes. The big P, according to what others want from us, whether that's our students or our bosses, is performance. We need results. We're measured all the time on our performance. So what results are we achieving and how? Um, what results are important to other people? And how um, is the practice of leadership and the power flows, all the other P's, informing those? The last P on there is one that's come through my research recently, which is the idea of problematization. If we keep questioning things, we keep them alive. Um, there are many um, problems in the world and many challenges in the world which may have a, a quick fix, but it's unlikely. The ones we deal with in the higher education sphere are quite complex, they're wicked problems. And if we try to believe that we've had a solution for them too quickly, there is a danger that we then they lose their energy because we stop thinking about them, we stop considering them, and they become the past, and they become assumptions which is dangerous. So my, my last P on there is to keep questioning everything. Keep it alive, keep your energy focused, keep mindful and keep present. This is about uh, sensory acuity and it's about agility. Okay, does that make sense there so far? Is anybody asleep already? No? Anybody too hungry for lunch? Okay, um, for the next couple of slides, what I'll do is I'll just talk at you if that's okay about um, the state we're in in terms of higher education in the UK basis uh, and globally. Um, and I'm pretty sure that you will find lots of resonance there with how it is in India. So we'll present the problems first and then we'll go on and do the more important stuff which is to look at how do we work in the state. So as you may be aware at the moment, we've got um, a Prime Minister and a government um, which came from uh, her legacy is um, Home Secretary, um, well, there's a creation of a hostile environment. And that's something that is deeply affecting uh, universities uh, and how they work, um, because a lot of our students, 22% of our students actually in the UK, are international. It also affects the culture. Um, culture doesn't exist outside of a university's walls, it comes in. So it's affecting everything we do, from uh, mental well-being to, to everything, really. We in the UK as leaders, um, I don't want to end, I don't want discussion, I don't want to think about this, I don't want to talk about this. Tell me what I need to know to pass the exam. <laughs> and I'm saying to them, sorry, but it doesn't work like that here. We need you to have an opinion and you to think for yourself. 
So we've got uh, a change in the climate here. Um, because of all the rest of this, we've got increase in mental health problems. Um, with staff and students, one department I've worked with recently had 50% of its staff on with anxiety and stress related disorders. Um, student wellbeing is a huge, huge concern now. Um, we've got job insecurity. Um, staff and faculty, um, tenure is no longer a given. Tenure is a bit of something out there in space, it's a bit of a fantasy. Um, we've had uh, lots of pension rights, lots of working rights and benefits. Most people are on short term contracts. This all changes the how we work. We can no longer focus on the long, the long view, which was traditionally the university domain, but we're now in a very short term, short term cycle. Your contract is only as long as your research grants or as long as your hourly contract by the university. And also in the UK, for the first time, we're really under intense scrutiny from the media. Um, before the, the, the broad sheets and the, the uh, red tops, we're looking only really at um, schools and the uh, health service. Now everybody is being watched, particularly vice chancellors. Uh, and vice chancellors' salaries have become a huge part of the agenda. So these are all what we call in Grimm's terminology wicked problems. You may have heard of these, these cycles of problems before. Um, they talk about tame problems and those which, if we look hard enough, well, there's something that we've done in the past which we can deploy, a process, a system, a project. If we choose the right one, we can fix the problem with this problem, with this response. It's, it's what management is, essentially. The other end of the spectrum in terms of problem classification is crisis. So, crikey, she's having a heart attack. Do something now. Get the ambulance. That's the command and control that response to a crisis. Um, it's very short term, it's incredibly hierarchical, it's non distributed decision making in the media. In the middle, we've got these wicked problems where complexity, they're not going to go away with a quick fix. There's nothing we've done before which will fix them. These are, according to Prince terminology, these are the ones that require leadership. So, leadership is our domain here, it's dealing with these interactions. In the UK, also, uh, particularly, we changed to an audit culture. Um, this is the result of this kind of mass, this rapid expansion of higher education into um, uh, a change from post 92 in the era, where we are now. And uh, also, the students paying fees, so students are now customers, and customers have rights, and customers have expectations. In this case, customers also have big debts. Um, so they want money for money, and they want to see that in their terms. So we're being measured. I guess you guys are also being measured. I know you've got national rankings, there are world rankings. Um, in the UK also we've got um, a whole bunch of other um, students, um, satisfaction surveys, destination surveys, how employable are our students, how is our research excellence, how is our teaching excellence, how is our knowledge exchange excellence, and on and on and on. So administration is quite huge here. And that's um, changed the nature of leadership in UK universities from very much the academic base that you have here to an all-powerful senior management team uh, who may or may not be academics. Often there's people brought in from outside um, of academia. So that's the world that we live in. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Are any of those problems common or challenges, shall we say, common to you and to your world? Yes, one or two, some nods, yes, yeah. I mean, I share these with you less from a lower educational background, some from very poor social conditions, and we need to meet all of those demands. We need to get them all to be digitally literate, uh, we need to get them all to be part and present in the modern world, and we need to get them all to be good citizens for society. Um, we've got shifting migration trends as well. The source countries are now becoming the destination countries, China being an example, Malaysia being another example. Students from India are now choosing to stay close to home, um, and it's the same in other regions as well. This will be having a big impact. I know that Mr Modi is very concerned with student outflows and would like to bring them back. So how do we, how do we in our institutions manage that? The publish or perish demands are escalating, now in the UK as an academic, you don't just have to publish in order to keep your job, you have to publish in a high impact factor journal or don't publish at all. 
Um, this is escalating, and this is global. And we've all got technology to deal with. We should be going online, we should have MOOCs, uh, we should have um, a virtual learning environment that is fit for the demands of our young people and our staff, and everybody needs to know how to do that. That requires a huge investment, it requires future proofing. How does that happen? Again, more wicked problems to deal with, all of those requiring leadership. However, it's not all doom and gloom, um, and the response to all of this it's very easy, as we've seen. We can all sit there and nod and go, yes, these are all problems. It's very easy to be negative and focus on the problems. The trick now, and this is what we'll do in the second part of the session, is to focus on the strengths. How do we use our strengths as leaders with our purpose to, to solve some of these problems? So there's always hope um, in this situation. In the UK, we're very lucky. Some of our strengths are around our research excellence, which uh, many of you have partner universities in the UK, you know about this. Um, we have a good infrastructure which supports quality. We've got good quality assurance and quality uh, management mechanisms. We've got the Haldane principle, which is the principle that politicians say at least two or three steps away from researchers and from academics. It's, it gets broken occasionally, but it's still there. We've got a strong ethics base in terms of how we do research and lots of guidance on, on, to keep us in order on that, to keep us asking useful questions about that. Um, the public generally like what academia does. They think it's a good thing and they've got good engagement in terms of universities working as part of their communities and vice versa, and there's generally a high regard. We're lucky enough to be well placed in those all-important world rankings with a few institutes, in fact quite a lot. And we've got a, a reasonably good reputation um, built on, a, on this strong past and this research um, excellence from, as a UK, as a nation, as the higher education sector, and also some individual um, universities within that. We're still an international destination with a number one and number two choices in, in uh, many different regions around the world. And we have a strong technology backbone and infrastructure across the higher education sector. So as vice chancellors, as leaders in UK higher education institutes and as a government agency, um, all of these factors are the things that we need to now focus on to try to um, solve some of the bigger challenges that we saw earlier. So the shift now is to think about how do we use our strengths um, to, to grow what we do. Well, here's, here's one kind of aspect of that. Uh, with a focus um, to working with enterprise and for universities, communities, universities, public engagement side uh, coming up, knowledge exchange, that third pillar um, of university admissions, um, is now worth £4.2 billion. Pounds. That was 2016, two years ago, to the UK economy. So by playing to our strengths, by building on those good relationships with industry um, and by encouraging inward investment, we actually managed to generate more income and that creates a virtuous circle. Um, so there are some good. Um, that also now has increased the amount of research that goes into research funding that goes into applied research and into what happens there. So leadership is not going to be easy. Leadership these days is not just about we call positive capabilities of decision making, action, go forward, do be the thing. It's not, it's not the Trump style. <coughs> Leadership in dealing with a lot of these wicked problems is about what we're calling negative capabilities. It's the ability to sit into a problem and to hold your people with you all together, purposefully moving through those problem states. It's about recognising that some of these problems will never be fixed and that's okay. It's about being comfortable in being uncomfortable. Being, finding comfort in discomfort. It's not easy. It's never going to be easy. It's always going to be hard. So that requires resilience and um, a certainty, a purposefulness, and which will glue us all together to get us through. As um, a very famous Indian once said, it's a journey of a thousand steps, um, and maybe more. And we won't know what those steps are until we take the next one. So as Keith said, it's about being in mysteries, it's about moving forward and sometimes moving backwards, but holding your people with you. The old model of the hero leader won't work in this model. 
a, a, hit, a hero leader is expected to, to know everything about everyone and every circumstance and to be able to find a solution um, instantly for all of those things. Frankly, if that happened, then I think we'd have a new religion on the world, in the earth. This type of leadership is going to require, yes, somebody at the top to make decisions, but done from an informed base um, with all of your people with you. So what does leadership look like in this complex world? We mentioned before those two Ps, and um, power is one of them, but in very tangible terms, um, some work done to know your purpose, what is your university for? Politicians would have us believe sometimes, and, and the public maybe, that universities are for producing employable graduates. That's one of the things. Um, is your university for that? Is that its main purpose? What's your university for? Is it for generating deep knowledge that may produce the next graphene, the next Nobel Prize, Prize winners? What's your core purpose? What gets you out of bed in the morning, but is ambiguous enough that it doesn't nail you down, it doesn't allow for generative research, it doesn't allow for expansion. As a quick task on your table, and this might be useful particularly when there's a couple of you from one university, think beyond the mission statement. Your university right here, right now, what's its core purpose? Why is it here? Can I give you two minutes just to talk with your neighbour and make a, a quick statement on that? What's the purpose of your university? Gentlemen and ladies from the um, uh, state, the Higher Education Commission Council, I would ask you the same question. What's your purpose? Two minutes. We're different, come to us, because... So the place and the uniqueness of your institute is also critical. And again, how do you, how do you, does everybody know this? Could everybody say the same thing if you ask any member of your staff? Would they all give you the same answer? And if not, then there's a job to do. The, the usefulness of these two things is in decision making. We talked before about the end of the hero leader and that distributed leadership is required and, and that all people need to be involved. We've got lots and lots of very talented people in our organisations. If we all know what the ground rules are, if we all know what the same basic framework is, we can all make decisions based on these. So should we innovate our curriculum in this way or this way? Well, if the purpose of our university is to support rural students and we've got a choice between uh, working online and in a distributed environment or working out uh, in, across the villages in terms of where do, we, where do we deliver, we go back to our purpose and we say, we interrogate this and we make that choice. So how do we, in the um, advanced HE, how do I, as a, a trainer, approach leadership purpose? in this setting? Well, we work from the premise um, that leadership is relational. It's about the glue between people. It's about the strengths of connectivities that we have. We, we don't operate alone. In order to affect change, it requires multiple people to be with us in that change. And that's down to the quality and the strength of those relationships that we have. Do people trust us or not trust us? Are they fearful? Do they, are they under surveillance? Um, do they believe the same things we do? Um, how well do we know each other? Are we shared, do we have shared values? Do we have shared ideas about what is good in the world? The more of those that we have, the more likely they are that people are to come with us on this journey, to, to follow us as guides. If leadership is not just a cognitive task, there's a lot of intellect goes into it, there's a lot of good thinkers out there, but it's also an embodied response. People don't do stuff because they think it's good. People do stuff because they feel it. They understand something and they feel motivated. They feel confident. They feel trusted. In order to be um, effective as leaders, we need to work with the whole of our, the whole of ourselves, not just the cognitive functions. 
And as I said before, we work with an appreciative methodology, which focuses on the good. So what are the strengths? We focus also in the four realms. We think about leadership development as something which is about self-awareness. How, how critical are we of ourselves? Do we know our own strengths? Do we know our weaknesses? Do we know how emotionally intelligent, how culturally intelligent are we? So working on those. We think about leading others, which is our teams, our people around us. How do we have immediate influence? How do we relate to those? What's the dynamic, the power dynamics between those people? We work across the organisation, leading the organisation in terms of the performance and the results that are employed, but also the structures, the systems and the processes. Too much of today will hear the, hear the discourse, particularly in the West, there's a leader in all of us. Leadership is in you, sir, and in you, and leadership is in you, and leadership is in you. That's great, and we can all be enabled to make decisions and act on leadership if we work in a place where the structures and the systems allow that to happen. So organisationally, are we fit to allow that leadership to, to flow across the organisation? And one thing that often gets forgotten, but I would say is increasingly important, is that influence beyond the organisation's walls, beyond the university's walls. We're not just done to by the outside world, we have options in how to deploy our resources to use our strengths, to change the working environment of the higher education sector. You've got relationships with your state council. Um, you've got relationships outwards into the business community, whether that's through friend networks, family networks, or professional ones. Uh, there are regulators, but if we have a good relationship with those regulators, it's possible that they may, we may be able to um, work in a more regulatory enabled environment. So how are we deploying resources to manage and lead outwards? Those are my questions. So, as a, um, I know lunch is dawning um, on us in about 15 minutes. Um, what I'd like for you to, to ask you to do is to think about the strengths-based approach. Um, what are the strengths of your university in particular? And then, which is the discovery phase of the appreciative inquiry. And what's the best you could possibly be? So we've, we've had a few people saying visionary is a, is a, a trait of leadership or is a, a, something that leadership could be. So if we were to vision forward using our strengths, the things that we know we're good at, if we could amplify our strengths up, if we could leverage those strengths, to manage and mitigate and reduce weakness, to um, turn opportunities into strengths and to reduce threats. What is the best possible shape our university would look like, feel like, and be like? How would it be? Challenges and uncertainties. This came from the group I was talking to in Mumbai. I don't know if those are similar to you. Um, but some of the main challenges and uncertainties in the environment here. So my request to you, with your hungry tummies before lunch, is to think about what are your strengths and how might we use our strengths to deal with these um, problems. Maybe just pick one challenge off here or one challenge that you have in your university and think about the strengths that you have and how you would use your strengths to overcome that challenge. Are you okay sitting on your tables or do you want to have a, a little bit of movement? Does anybody want to move? Are you happy with your people? Yes. No fighting? No. Good, okay. So number one, what are your strengths in your university? Write those down. I'm hoping there's a huge list of strengths, things that are fantastic about your university, about your people, your reputation, your structures, your performance. Write those down. Second, pick a challenge. Third, take the strengths and how are you going to use your strengths to destroy this challenge, to overcome it, or to reduce it to a level where it's manageable. Yeah? Is that okay? On a table? If we can do this successfully, I think we're allowed to go for lunch. Okay? Five, ten minutes for this activity. What are your strengths? 
list them. Number two, pick a problem. Number three, use the strengths to reduce the challenge or get rid of the threat. Okay? Delegates from British Council, both from India and abroad, my fellow Vice Chancellors and Universities. But aims and goals of the University or the Vice Chancellor or the administration of the University are, I think, same. There will be no difference in the goals. 
approach will be different approach will be different but goal will be the same goal is to produce highly qualified highly talented human resources in the field like engineers scientists researchers faculty but these days we are very much bothered about the employability of even undergraduate student employability for a btech student is very good but employability for a ba bsc become student we are bothered i personally feel ba bcom bsc is a course a basic course it's a basic course in my point of view i may be wrong also somebody may correct me it's a basic course a science graduate is also eligible for a clerk job he is also eligible for a clerk job employability starts with improving communication skills but i consider communication skills is it a skill that needs to be given a training at ug level and pg level and engineering level the student is coming out of the school that is plus 2 12 years of english knowledge he had 12 years of telugu language he had 12 years of hindi urdu whatever it is there so what school teachers were doing all these days what school teachers were doing all these days so there the schools and junior colleges are not able to produce students to fluently or semi fluently talk for few minutes about the subjects learned by them so that is what say this is in my point of view higher education is not the platform to give communication skills and today today in the state of telangana even in the rural areas we have only english medium schools there are almost no telugu medium schools this is one point to be noted with everybody but still we are forced to give them uh, communication skills we are providing you see giving a lecture here is different and handling my student on the campus is different it is true that our students are even in pg our students are not up to the mark with their communication skills we have to improve them that's one thing but my question is that what they were doing in their school what are the levels that means a person who could not speak for 2 minutes in english or 3 minutes in english we are trying to award him a pg degree and say that we are producing so many post graduates how far it is true how far it is true this is as far as the student quality is concerned it doesn't mean that all the students in universities and colleges are not up to the mark we are bothered about the people who are not up to the mark but the number is more number is more our teachers are surviving because there are some good students also in the classroom there is some potential with our teachers to undertake research more actively because they are finding good students who are capable of doing research out of the six students they are with each teacher at least four or five are good four are good if not if two are not very good but in the in the, in the company of those four good students these two will survive that is the system how it is going on so now what is actually your position what do you do being a vice chancellor being a vice chancellor whether i am given a 100 years old university whether i am given a 5 years old university the aim of both the vice chancellors will be the same that to convert or to improve your institute to be the best in your state at least to be the best in your state at least best in what not in terms of result best in terms of your practices best in terms of making a student committedly spending more time not just for 10 to 6 but 10 to 5 but even prior to 10 and after 5 the student should be motivated to stay on the campus spending some time either in a sports field or in a group discussion with his colleagues or interacting with his teacher 
or interact is going into a library working with networking and all that surfing the various sites and all that so student it is the duty of the university to make the student to stay on the campus in academic atmosphere at least right after breakfast in the morning to just before the dinner and after dinner after dinner he should, he will be just let free and let him do whatever he likes that that is that atmosphere should be there but unfortunately this atmosphere is not there in any of our universities <coughs> i always say that we are not clerks teachers vice chancellor registrar anybody we are prone we are prone by our teachers to do some special jobs like teaching teaching is preparing human resources good human resources there is no other profession where human resources is prepared this is the only industry where human resources are prepared generated these are the most valuable products on the earth only our students the quality of our student their their quality is the isi mark for that product so i think our universities today for various reasons not able to produce stamped quality human resources some are coming if we are not producing how usa is surviving usa is surviving because of only students from india and china maybe so usa is surviving because of our products only but what is the percentage of good human resources that we are producing we also know that we are not for the best student the best student i don't think the minimum depends on us an average students depends on us more and most of the average students are retained in india so growth of india depends on the average student who is produced in our universities the best product of our country is living abroad in spite of average students that we produce our country is now competing with almost all countries in many issues and we are ranked best in some issues across the world so if this is the case then our growth is very slow so therefore our job is to produce convert these average students into the best products so convince them to stay on the campus and we should for that teacher should feel teacher registrar administrator vice chancellor everybody should feel that my job is not 6 hours or 7 hours job but my job is 24 by 7 my job is 24 by 7 today we have some people in government service working on deputation maybe from universities from colleges i know that they are working 24 by 7 in offices they were supposed to be teachers elsewhere they are in offices work doing office duty coordinating various academic issues between institutes and the government they are working for 24 by 7 but if they are relieved from here and asked them to go to a college in a maybe few kilometers away from the hometown or maybe city then i am sure that they will not work for 24 by 7 that is the mindset today we have a person who has worked in office should be able to also be able to work in his college right from morning to evening so this mindset is because of various reasons so there should be change in the thinking process of teachers itself they should not compare with any other uh, employee in the state or anywhere we are different we are this is a unique community this is unique community where the development of the nation development of the state development of your town development of your street you you can you must have observed that even in your society even in your apartments even in your community in your street you are given a different look i mean whenever people interact with you you find yourself that you are honored and uh, you will be treated in a separate way because everybody has recognized that we are a different community but we have not uh, recognized ourselves that we are a different community so what are the responsibilities of this different community so that that's very important because only these psychological issues they 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 are responsible for the upliftment of the status of all the educational institutions whether it is degree college or university whether it is a degree college or the university this is this is the basic thing thinking mindset of an individual how you think yourself 
then put your talent put your talent into your just now we have seen a big uh, um, uh, what you call uh, uh, boxes uh, some 10 10 rules were there how what leadership components of the leadership they are unknowingly we have been following all the 10 today we came to know that they are in order but uh, we don't know that that exists but we have been following all that and definitely one who is following all that will get a success there is no doubt about it so this is very important but to tell you that again giving speech is very simple but we have two universities with us Usmani University and Kakati University very well renowned universities and very old universities and uh, there is nothing that they have to further develop only they should sustain only they should sustain they should bother about the sustenance of their universities but we should bother developing our universities because our universities are very small very small and quite young without any proper infrastructure we should sustain we, we should develop then sustenance will come after another 20 to 30 years so therefore a vice chancellor should first decide whether you need sustenance or development so in sustenance what sustenance sustenance of what sustenance of quality of academics sustenance of quality of academics not the buildings quality academics a teacher should be made to come on time to college should be made to stay in the college up to and beyond college hours that is the duty of the vice chancellor and the administrator any administrator then next accordingly students should be available for a teacher to teach it is also the duty of the teacher concerned duty of the principal concerned duty of the registrar concerned duty of the vice chancellor concerned everyone is responsible that every student should be made to sit in the classroom that is our duty whether he is a UG student or a PG student or a doctoral student it is very very essential admissions should be made strictly adhering to the procedure laid down approved procedure laid down any violation will direct will have direct impact on the quality of the product there should be con comprehensive and consolidated uniformity in curriculum that is very very essential very very essential in one university the examination system should be uniform if it is a semester system then the pattern of examination or structure of examination in my point of view it should be uniform within a faculty within a faculty within a faculty it should be uniform otherwise measurement principle will be violated or deviated it should be uniform because today what you are saying is you want accountability for every act of the student because we are in credits we are in credits and choice based credit system we are trying to open our hands and make student freely think and opt for whatever he want even if the instruction is not available the student is allowed to choose one of the subjects of his interest his interest so we are liberalizing our education so in liberalizing the education you cannot have different methods of measurement different levels of measurement ultimately everything should be measured under and brought to a common uniform measurement scale that is very very essential that is very very essential that is missing in our universities these days that is missing in our universities so for that now i request from this dais i take it as an opportunity for to uh, request to the state council to take this issue of making curriculum activity very common very common to all the universities then there may be a question what about the autonomy of the university if state council does all these things what is autonomy what is autonomy have we really understood our autonomy the meaning of autonomy in my point of view, no. You cannot, because you are a state university, you cannot have autonomy everywhere. You are not a free thinker in terms of money, that is income from grant from, bringing grant from, you know, uh, government. You, it is related to various issues. So, uh, there is no question of any success or failure of bringing money from the government. In spite of your efforts, if the government uh, releases money, you will get it. 
Of course, afterwards you can regard it as your success. That's a different story. Right? But when you come to curriculum, you are independent. Implementation of curriculum, you are independent. No government agency will ask you what you are doing. That is autonomy. But you will not have autonomy in selecting a scale of assessment of your choice. That you cannot do. Because all the students that are output of any institution in the state, that is the secret of implementing choice based credit system, that mobility should be given. So mobility should be easy. Mobility will be easy when all these parameters are common in all universities. They should be common. That we have not ensured so far. Timbadri sir, please make a note of this. We have not ensured that all are common. We have not ensured. This is very, very important, sir. Even today there is a, a problem. In mathematics, physics, chemistry, botany, zoology, microbiology, biotechnology, and these are the subjects. In all these subjects, they have come under single faculty. There is a dean faculty of science. There is individual board of studies in each department, in each subject, right? In my point of view, you cannot have a different model for the question paper separate for these subjects. They come under same faculty, right? A result also you declare, declare by faculty of science, with the title faculty of science. And your question paper model is different. Your maximum marks allotted is different. So with these differences, how can you publish your results under a common table of title of faculty of science? They should not only be same in single university, but they should be same across the state, all in universities. Otherwise, there will be no commonality. So therefore, you cannot think that if I ask somebody, somebody was saying that, sir, autonomy, then what is autonomy? You do your exercise in your university. If I have to do my exercise in my university, why state council should prepare prepare the syllabi and send it to us? If I have to do exercise at my own, then why state council has to prepare the syllabi? I will prepare best syllabi with my resources available with me. Why do you think that I am inferior? No, these are all just logically, I am not, not questioning anybody. I am trying to analyze the scenario of universities. So the standards, the best product will come only when these things are quite common. So this is the, uh, these are the responsibilities of the teacher administrators. Leadership means not an individual. Only vice chancellor is not the leader for the university. He will become leader only when he works with a team. With a team. Registrar is there, deans are there, state board of studies chairperson are there. So various administrators are there, even student welfare officer. Even a warden in hostels is a very important parameter. That fellow is really responsible for any disturbance or handling the disturbance. He is the person who is really contributing to the system. So therefore, all that put together becomes a leader. As an individual, as a vice chancellor, he will not become a leader. So he is a leader because of the efforts and contribution of all these personalities. So similarly, when state claims that we have done so many things, then I think universities and state council uh, should work together and uh, universities, university expert, as today afternoon, today afternoon we have uh, transforming teaching and learning. I don't think vice chancellor will transform teaching and learning. It is the academic leaders in the universities like Deans, chairpersons, board of studies, I think they will definitely transform teaching and learning into best uh, of, of the education. Best of the education. So, shall I stop? Right, thank you very best much. Best of the education. So, thank with these few ideas, um, uh, just my reflection. So, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Um, and great to hear, finish on a positive note about the. the Good afternoon to all of you. Honorable Chairman Telangana State Council of Higher Education, Professor Papariti Garu, Honorable Vice Chancellors of uh, Mahatma Gandhi University and I think Palamuru University, Professor Alta Hussain and Professor Rajarath Namgaru, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Fine Arts University, Madam. Madam uh, and uh, registrars here, principals, various administrators, 
delegates from Brit British Council, distinguished participants here, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I am thankful to State Council of Higher Education for conducting this wonderful event on leadership in higher education institutions and strategies to transform teaching and learning. I am from Usmani University, I'm registrar of the university, I am Professor Gopal Reddy. Actually, I am representing my Vice Chancellor, Professor S. Ramachandram Garu, who is away uh, to Delhi. Of course, ours is the largest university in the state, state of Telangana. Not only state of Telangana, it is the seventh largest university in entire India and seventh oldest also. And this is the university which was started by an erstwhile king of the Nizam. And this is the only university whose medium of instruction at its inception was Urdu, a vernacular language. And of course, it is also one of the largest affiliating universities. We have more than 750 affiliated colleges. I think almost half of the Telangana is under the jurisdiction of our university. And it is also ranked university, ranked by NAC. I think three times we have been ranked with the highest grades. Last year, our university is ranked by NAC, National Assessment and Accreditation Council with the highest grade of A+. Plus. And also recently, UGC has conferred us the Category 1 status. Of course, as Sir rightly said, it is a old university. Only thing is that we have to sustain, which is, of course, it is a glorious past this university has. And we have to sustain that glory and that those academic standards. And last year, we have also conducted centenary celebrations on completing 100 years of its existence. We have very good infrastructure, no doubt, but because of its age, as I said, it's 100 years old university, most of the infrastructure has also become old, sir. And most of the buildings are aged buildings, more than 60 years, 70 years buildings are there, including our own arts college. Of course, we are also trying to develop the infrastructure we have a very good central facilities are there. And recently, we have also established a data center. A state-of-the-art data center has been established in the university. I think no other university in entire South India has got that facility. So with the funding from RUSA, we have established that. And coming to more, many, of course, strengths we have so many. But coming to our, uh, what we call the challenges, as any other university in, the, in India is facing, we are also facing the shortage of teaching staff. Not only teaching staff, of course, sir, whenever we talk in such conferences, whenever we talk of the staff, we talk of only the teaching staff. But, but because we are the largest university having almost 53 departments, we are having 53 teaching departments and most of them are science and engineering departments are there. And we are also having an acute shortage of non-teaching staff, including the technical staff. We are not having sufficient number of lab assistants, lab attenders, technicians, so many. So, and even we are facing the shortage, we service the even the lab uh, office attenders also we are not having now. Sufficient number of not teaching staff is a problem. Of course, teaching staff is a big problem. Our actually our sanctioned teaching strength is around 1300, whereas we are now running the university with only 500 regular staff. That's the, of course, this, this problem is there in, in, in entire India across all the universities. And uh, coming to the, of course, our strengths, we are having, a, of course, infrastructure is there, 
so many constant colleges are there, so many affiliated colleges are there. And, but besides that actually, this university from its inception is drawing the students from the rural background only. Most of the students even now, even today we are getting the students belonging to first generation only. With a lot of aspirations, lot of no hopes, they come to the university and we have to cater to their aspirations and to their demands. One of the problems is of course residents, that means the hostel problem is there. Even now, in spite of increasing the number of hostels, we are not able to provide the, uh, what we call the accommodation to all the students. Hostel problem is there. And of course, because of the dwindling number of teaching staff, uh, there is also a problem uh, in respect of our instruction, teaching and all that. We are, we are running out of every month, at least five to six experienced teachers are retiring professors are retiring and we are facing a shortage of teachers and we are finding it very difficult to uh, in the uh, teaching and learning uh, areas that is also there and coming to and opportunities we can say we have recently introduced certain new skill based market driven programs to increase the employability for example after a long time in engineering college, we also started a program in MTech mining. We, of course, with the support of the alumni belonging to you know, Singarini Colleries. And we are also trying to have linkages, partnerships with other universities, particularly other established and prestigious foreign universities through MOUs. And we are also trying to internationalize our education. And at present, Osman University is the only university, I think it's one of the universities, which has got about more than 3,000 foreign students are studying in our university, coming from almost 87 countries. I think the correct number is around 3,500 students belonging to 87 different countries are studying their education in our university, leading to a kind of internationalization not only that, no, our students are also gaining from the experiences of those uh, students. And of course, as I said, no, it's because uh, the uh, Professor Halta Hussein, Honorable Vice Chancellor, has already dwelled into so many general issues. So therefore, I am confining only to our university. As I said, the aspirations of the students who are coming, it is more. And our university is giving graduation, patas every year to almost around 3.5 lakh students. More than 3.5 lakh students are getting graduated from this university every year and it is very, very difficult to fulfill the aspirations of all those students. Mostly they need the jobs, employment opportunities and no university, no government can give employment to such a large number of students. This is one. and. Of course, coming to these leadership issues, I don't know whether uh, the, because uh, earlier uh, in the morning session I've been hearing, of course, as Sir rightly said, knowingly or unknowingly, because we are, we came from academic side, we are not born leaders or we are not trained leaders. We are only by virtue of our you know, experience we have become leaders in the universities. And I think that all the administrators, vice chancellors, registrars, controller of examinations and other administrators, all of us are having all those qualities which were you now being taught about, uh, talked to in the first session. Of course, we, we do not know that we, we are having so many qualities, but after hearing to that lecture, I realized that we have all those qualities because we have, to, we have to deal with the students who are young. Most of the students who come to us, whether in the classroom, whether uh, in some other issues, because as I said, ours is the biggest university. Every day, in addition to the classroom teaching, so many other issues will come up. Even today, I am here and something is going on in my chambers. Some dharna, some strike, you know, a group of students come, Various issues you know, are there 
So every day we have to deal with number of issues, number of groups. And problem is that, madam, they are all very young students below the age of 25, whereas we are all old administrators above the age of 50. And it's a match between that young group and this old group. And somehow we have to manage those students. It's a big challenge actually in the conventional universities like ours to deal with the students. In spite of having so many leadership qualities, very often we find it difficult to, to deal with those issues. That is a, that's the problem. That problem is also there. Anyway, another challenge is there, of course, finances. And ours is a big university, and our budget is around 600 crores of Indian rupees. Of course, government is supporting to some extent, but remaining we have to internally generate. And even to pay the salaries every month, we have to know on the last week of the month, we have to <laughs> go to some pillar to post to gather some amount from control of examinations or from some other directorate to pay the salaries also. I think the smaller universities are not having that problem, but we are facing a lot of problem even with respect to our finances also. So that's, so, so many challenges are coming up anyway. So, but, but anyway, but we are uh, going on and we are giving no doubt very standard education to our most aspiring students coming from very you know, poor background. Most of us, most of our students, unlike our IITs, our IIMs, or other centrally funded universities, it is a state funded university and we are catering to the needs of only the first generation students coming from very poor backgrounds. And here the leadership is entirely different. We have to de deal with entirely different group of students. Anyway, I am thankful to the Council of Higher Education for taking up this, for conducting this you know, uh, one, day to one day workshop. And again, I am also thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Really good to have chancellors for their comments. And I have to say, actually, that um, a lot of the points that they touched on, I think, um, are hopefully going to be drawn out, uh, particularly in relation to teaching and learning this afternoon. And maybe there will be some tools presented um, that can actually assist in facing some of those challenges. Um, and what I want to do is take that idea of challenge um, to start off with this afternoon. And I really want to, to get you thinking about how do we challenge traditional thinking? A lot of us have been doing things the same way for many, many years. And that's great, and it may work, but it doesn't mean to say that there aren't other ways. And perhaps we should sometimes try the other ways. Maybe start small and experiment and pilot, but then maybe something could work and actually prove to be more effective. We do this in our technology centers. We do this uh, when we're starting new businesses. I mean, you know, look at Apple and what they have achieved by trying something different and challenging the norm. So I have a question for you on your tables, and I'm going to give you two minutes to discuss this question. You are all academics. I am an academic. I am from an academic background myself. I've worked in universities for over 20 years, all around the world, on four continents. Um, so I understand this idea of traditional universities. I've worked in some of the world's top universities, and I've worked in some that are not the top universities. So it really does vary, but there are certain ideas in higher education that are very, very fixed. And I have a question. So the question is, oops, I hope I haven't gone too far. Ah! Yeah. What, does, what does a PhD doctoral dissertation look like? I'm not talking about what's in it. I'm talking about when you look at it, when your students present it to you, when you have it on your desk, what does it look like? So with your table, just have a conversation about what you would see when your PhD students give you that dissertation. Uh, 
thick fat bound book of original thought that should help me enhance my understanding of an idea. Original and enhance. Thank you very much. So it's going to have original thought and enhance your idea. Okay, so it's taking us on a journey. Do we agree? Okay. Now, I think if you ask any academic around the world, they're going to pretty much agree with those statements, yeah? So just keep in mind, thick, fat book, original thought, take you on a journey, enhancing ideas, yeah? Okay. So, presented for a PhD, it passed the PhD with flying colours, it has since been published in many languages, and it is a valid PhD. Does it look like a traditional PhD? You're going to see some paper, some colored paper. Can you find the paper? Yeah. Now, please note that the, some of this paper is sticky, okay? You want the sticky side on the back, okay? So make sure the sticky is on the back, please. We also had some brilliant teachers described. Um, we had everybody from a religious teacher through to um, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, I think. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in is why. Why were they so special? So can somebody give me a characteristic? of one of the teachers that they heard about, that they listened to somebody else about, that was described, that made them so special. One thing. And uh, it was not just about physics, but the way he looked at life, and that's what they have learned from him. The positive attitude of the teacher. That's what I heard from him. So they used to say loudly. So speaking loudly uh, was a, a to motivate them. So if you are a scary teacher, you might put off a student, and maybe by being incredibly strict and disciplined in a scary way, that can actually be demotivating. But maybe by being disciplined and strict, but in a friendly, positive way, you can actually encourage your students. So that's something to hold on to. I'm going to just take one last contribution on this point. Okay. You know, the human principles, respecting others, though we were students, you know, then treating, you know, all of us, you know, on par with, you know, each other. Beautiful. Thank you very much. What a lovely positive. We're going to save those ideas for later because you're going to actually need to use them again. So keep those in your head, please. And I'm just going to move on and talk a little bit about what we're going to do this afternoon. Is that universities are not only about teaching. Universities are also about doing research. They're also about the elements of leadership that are needing to be shown and also about the professional support services such as your libraries and all the other underpinning aspects that make a university. But today we're focusing on teaching. And specifically I'm going to look at four key areas. I'm going to give you a little bit of talk now about the UK situation. And then we're going to move into having a look at something that has been developed as a tool that might help you in your situations called the Professional Standards Framework. And then we're going to have a look at a professional recognition scheme that's used now globally for teachers. 
Um, and I hope that might address some of the points that were raised about how do you retain teachers and how do you recognize teaching. Um, and then we'll hopefully have a bit of time to look at application and impact in your own situations. So if we start um, to have a look at what my aims are today, I'm going to try and get you to understand a little bit more about these global professional standards and to look at how those can be applied in many different ways, in different contexts and different types of institution. And we're going to explore some areas of strategic leadership in relation to teaching and also think about the opportunities as how you can enhance quality in your own areas. Okay? So, in the UK, what's going on there? Well, teaching excellence has become something quite high up on the academic agenda uh, within universities but also in government. And primarily, we must not forget that universities are there for educational learning gain. So it's about taking our students on a journey and then giving them an outcome at the end in whatever area they're in. But increasingly, like you, we are seeing the pressures of commercialization in universities. And one of the things is that there has become an increasing focus on student satisfaction. Students are often paying for their university study, so they are customers, and they want to know that they're getting value for money. Universities have a dual role to focus on teaching and research. And so how do we rebalance that? Um, and so one of the ways um, that the UK government um, and education system has been looking at that is by trying to determine how to measure what is good teaching. They've had a research excellence framework in the UK for some time, and recently they brought in a teaching excellence framework. And now they've actually brought in a knowledge exchange framework as well. And these frameworks measure universities. They benchmark universities against each other. Now, the Teaching Excellence Framework is optional, but it is linked to tuition fees. So, if you are measured as being better, you can actually charge more in terms of your fees. Um, and there are three levels of award that are given, gold, silver and bronze. This is being rolled out across universities and across colleges in the UK and as I say at the moment it is optional. But in the first round, so we've just completed the first round of this measurement process and so 298 institutions took part. Of those that received gold, there were 72 institutions, so 24% got gold. And believe me, those universities are showing that badge on their websites. They want that gold. If they didn't get gold, they're not happy. And they, they are aiming for gold. And if you got gold, you want to maintain gold. Okay? Silver, 47% of institutions obtained silver. And 21 achieved bronze. There were a few who got what we call provisional awards. And that's not because they didn't get it, it's because there was a technicality. Um, because to, in order to get an award, they are measured on both quantitative data and survey statistics, but also qualitative data. They have to make a case. And in some institutions, they don't actually have the quantitative data to present. So that's the reason why. Now, as an organization, my organization helped to develop the teaching excellence framework. It does not manage it, it does not control it, but we help to contribute. And in our view, um, the key components of teaching excellence are making sure that as an institution, you have professionally qualified staff who are continuously developing. They're not staying the same, they're not staying static. They're continuing to learn throughout their careers and to develop. 
They have a clear sense of what works for students. And they're thinking about that in terms of their learning gain and also about their experience. I, I, interestingly, one of the vice chancellors just now talked about what goes on outside the nine to five. That's exactly that point. Uh, there's also the issue of strategic leadership for teaching and learning and a corporate approach, which is some of the areas that we touched on this morning. And I think also mentioned earlier was this idea of continuous curriculum development looking at making sure your curriculum is aligned, it's learning outcomes based, uh, making sure that employability, etc., is embedded. So those are the things we think are important. And my organization can help in a number of ways. So we're going to touch on the professionalization of teaching this afternoon. We're also um, an organization that can help you develop student success. So this is areas where, and um, I know there was some talk earlier also about assessment methods and making sure assessment and feedback is standardized and that it makes sense. My organization has a lot of experience at looking at universities all over the world to see how that can be most effective. Uh, equally, things like employability, retention and attainment of your students. Somebody talked about the dropout rate of STEM students. That's something we are experienced with and we can help with. And indiv individual development as well, looking at the career journey of teaching staff from new teacher to maybe vice chancellor. That journey along the way, staff need support. They need to develop new skills, new knowledge at different stages. Now, I talked about student success and one of the things we have developed, and if you go to our website, you can actually download copies of these. We have six areas that we have focused on in terms of developing student success frameworks. And we've developed these kind of discussion tools. And these discussion tools can be used at a high level in your institution, right down to departmental level. And they cover the areas that you need to focus on. So for each of these areas, we have a discussion wheel that can be used in internationalization talks, that can be used in assessment. And they cover the key areas. It's like a checklist of things that you need to think about if you're going to have those discussions. Also, we have a series of surveys and audits that we can conduct. Um, so we've done lots of surveys on students and like, hearing the student voice. So if they're research postgraduate students, what are they thinking? How do they feel about their experience? And if you can then compare that with another institution, you start to be able to benchmark and measure your own achievement can we do better is there an area where we need to improve so we can help with that but finally we also offer awards so um, we've recently um, implemented a global teaching excellence award it's been running for two years now uh, the first year the university of huddersfield in the uk was the winner and the second year, this year, McMaster University in Canada. So if you need examples of great universities doing great things in teaching, those would be two good examples for you. Now I'm going to move on and talk about professional standards. And I said when you did your beautiful artwork, I wanted you to keep in your head those characteristics. So I'm going to ask you to move now. And I'm going to ask you to make sure we've got six tables, okay? So I'm going to have one table here, one table here, one here, one here, one here, and one here, okay? So if you are not on one of those tables, you need to move, please, okay? So gentlemen here, can you move forward? Gentlemen at the back, can you please move forward and join a group? Gentlemen at the front, can you turn and move inwards, please? 